Welcome to the Deck 4 Podcast. You can access episodes, companion articles, research notes and links, as well as information about our contributors and supporters at deck4podcast.com. Hope you enjoy the program. Hello and thank you for listening. In this episode, we pay tribute to the last of Dad's Army's Magnificent Seven, Ian Lavender, who of course played Private Pike, and who passed away on February 2nd, 2024, aged 77. I'm delighted um, we're joined once again by leading UK television historian, publisher, author and podcaster Oliver Crocker to share his thoughts on this very talented gentleman and also to recall his own memorable experience working with Ian Lavender on a segment for ITV's This Morning. Now, although Private Pike remains his most enduring and universally beloved creation, we also take a wider look at Ian Lavender's remarkable career beyond Dad's Army, which encompassed radio, television, feature films and theatre. I was really sad to hear about the passing of Ian Lavender. What a wonderful actor. Now, we never interviewed Ian Lavender for the Dad's Army podcast, simply because, let's face it, he was still a really big star. When I was living with Frank Williams and Ronnie Grange, Ian at that time was on the West End, starring in Sister Act the Musical. In fact, I remember coming home from work one evening and Frank and Ronnie revealed that they'd seen Ian, not in the show, but nearby. They were on a corner in Oxford Street, waiting to meet another friend. I remember Frank and Ronnie saying that suddenly from behind them, a warm hand landed on each of their shoulders and a very handsome, white-haired, white-bearded, tall gentleman said, What are you two bastards doing here? And the three of them enjoyed a long chat and a Dad's Army reunion that no one else knew was happening. I also recall around this time the BBC soap opera Doctors, which, as I record this, is today recording its last ever episode. Well, when they celebrated their 1,000th episode, they wanted a special guest star to appear. And who better than Ian Lavender, playing a character called Roland Beckley, named after Doctor's casting director. I think it's a huge tribute to Ian, but he was chosen. And now Oliver alluded to the Dad's Army podcast there. We'll um, give some more details about that and some other suggestions for further viewing, reading and listening towards the end. Talking to the BBC in 2022, Ian Lavender recalled that at drama school, he'd been playing juvenile and romantic leads. His only comedy experience before Dad's Army was in restoration plays, and he was spotted by Dad's Army producer David Croft in a television play for Rita Fusion, one of the earlier ITV franchises, part of an anthology series, Half Hour Stories. Um, The play was called Flowers at My Feet. As a result of his appearance in that, uh, Ian Lavender was cast from the very first Dad's Army episode broadcast in black and white in the summer of 1968. Now, although the character of Private Pike will always be identified by Captain Mannering's famous Don't Tell Him Pike, uh, many fans, I think, um, especially now, look to some of the quieter character-driven moments when considering what made Dad's Army special and why the characters and actors are held in such affection even so many years on. Ian Lavender himself cited a scene from The Making of Private Pike, which was an episode from the final series in 1977. Um, Pike is taken the ALP warden's niece, Sylvia, to the pictures, and at Sylvia's urging, they've borrowed Captain Mannering's staff car, which runs out of petrol on the way home. The pair end up staying out all night, with Pikey pushing for nine miles to get home. It doesn't stop everyone getting entirely the wrong idea, of course, and this leads to a man-to-man chat with Sergeant Wilson, a quiet two-hander between Ian Lavender and John LeMessurier, which remained one of Ian Lavender's favourite scenes. A lot of people will know that you spent the night together, and a lot of people will tell you that what you did was wrong. I was pushing, she was steering. Yes, what I was pushing. <laughs> But to my way of thinking, what you both did wasn't evil. Do you follow me? It was nine miles. <laughs> uh, our sort of society has a rather rigid framework. And uh, if we don't stay within it, people will point the finger at us. Well, now to cap Grant's Hill. <laughs> 20 yards at a time. Yes, well, just remember this, Frank. I understand. Now, we haven't been too close, I know, just recently, but uh, now I feel we're sort of, uh, you know what I mean, uh, kindred spirits, sort of 
you know, sort of men of the world. Do you feel like that too? Yeah. <laughs> Kindred spirits. Men of the world. <laughs> Oliver's now going to share this um, wonderful encounter he had with Ian Lavender when Oliver was producing a segment for ITV. Um, just be aware there are a couple of instances of fruity language in the context of the story. I finally met Ian in 2013. At the time, I was working as a researcher in the features department for ITV's This Morning, a magazine show that has been running in the UK since 1988. I was working on a strand called Male Cancer Awareness Week. The plan was to interview a number of well-known celebrities who had had cancer and ask them to lend their support to the campaign. I think it's fair to say that being given free reign to make a series of celebrity interviews with anyone I chose who fit the bill uh -huh, led me to be rather indulgent with who I approached. Of course, they needed to have suffered cancer and recovered but it was also a chance for me to meet people I'd rather like to meet. So I shot an interview with Doctor Who's Fraser Hines. I shot an interview with The Bill's Ben Richards. I shot an interview with snooker legend Jimmy White. And I got to shoot an interview with Ian Lavender. I was to record the interview at Ian's home in Suffolk. At the time, I didn't own a car, and indeed I didn't live in Suffolk, though my wife's parents did and in fact we now do. I got the train up to Bury St Edmunds and then a taxi to Ian's home. I must confess, I was really excited. Now I have to be honest, when I arrived, Ian wasn't in a particularly good mood, though there was a reason for this. His laptop had installed an update overnight, which had changed the entire functionality of his computer. He asked me, do you know anything about computers? <laughs> To which I honestly replied, well, not really, very little. He obviously felt he needed to get this off his chest and suddenly yelled, I never fucking asked for this! I didn't know what to say. Ian Lavender, Private Pike himself, had just yelled and sworn at his computer right in front of me and I was slightly taken aback. There was a pause. Having got this off his chest, he suddenly turned around with a really warm smile and said, Right, shall we have a cup of tea? <laughs> I followed him through to his kitchen and then explained who I was. The fact that I'd lived with Frank Williams and Ronnie Grange and that I'd made a documentary about Frank at university and that they spoke so warmly and fondly about him. I recall he said, Well, now this all makes perfect sense. <laughs> we shot the interview in his garden. He was fascinated by the camera I was using, a uh, Canon 600D. I was experimenting at the time with different lenses, and he indulged me. Something that didn't make the interview, and he told me off camera. And I'm going to share with you now because, A, I feel like he'd want me to say it. And B, it says a lot, I think, about what famous people have to endure from the hands of the press. Ian revealed it in the 90s when he'd had cancer. A report had gone out that Ian Lavender was, I quote, a six-stone skeleton. There were press camped outside Ian's home all night, waiting for a photo of the person described in the report. When Ian walked out, looking quite healthy in the morning, one of the paparazzi said, Where's Lavender? To which Ian politely replied, You're looking at him. The paparazzi looked Ian up and down and said, Well, you're no fucking good, are you? And they all drove off in unison. Ian said the fact that he had got through his cancer and wasn't a six-stone skeleton didn't make for a good story. Ian suffered with cancer, I believe, at least three times throughout his life. Throughout his interview for this morning, which I uploaded to my YouTube channel for anyone to look at, he talks about how important it is to not be a stupid boy and to go and get anything you are concerned with checked out. And he praised the support of his family and the doctors and surgeons who cured his cancer at that time. Perhaps my fondest memory of that day was me explaining that my mother-in-law, who lived nearby, was meeting me afterwards to take me out for a sandwich and then give me a lift back to the station. He then sweetly said, well, can I come and say hello? 
So I'll never forget my mother-in-law's face when as she pulled up in her car, she saw me standing next to the great man himself, and he couldn't have been more charming. He stood and talked to Mummy Lynn, as I call her, for a good 15 minutes. They talked about Suffolk and the local architecture, things happening in the press and politics. It was a very jovial and sweet conversation. I got a photo with them together, and you can see how awestruck Mummy Lynn was at meeting Ian Lavender. And Oliver's interview with Ian Lavender is, as Oliver said, available on his YouTube channel. And we've also embedded that in this episode's webpage um, on our website, deckfullpodcast.com. And we have some other suggestions and links there as well. Now, Ian Lavender always expressed his deep gratitude for having worked on Dad's Army, but he admitted that typecasting had held back his career to a degree, particularly when it came to movies. He did appear in a handful of classic mid-70s British films, including Carry On Behind, Not Now Comrade, and Confessions of a Pop Performer. Now, Frank Pike had another airing in a BBC radio sequel to Dad's Army, It Sticks Out Half a Mile, and he starred with Arthur Lowe, Liz Fraser, and Kenneth Connor in a delightful BBC radio comedy centred around a country railway station called Parsley Sidings. He also featured with Molly Sugden in one of David Croft's rare catastrophes, the sci-fi sitcom Comeback Mrs. Noah. Now, he also uh, had a number of uh, memorable cameos on various British television shows, including Man About the House, uh, Keeping Up Appearances and Goodnight Sweetheart, and created one of the memorable peripheral characters in Yes Minister, uh, Dr. Cartwright, an economic specialist working for the Department of Administrative Affairs. What function do you perform? in the department. Don't you know? Uh, Yes, I know, but the minister wants to know. I'm a professional economist, director of local administration statistics. Oh, and you were running the local authority directorate before we took it over. Dear me, no. Sir Gordon Reid was the permanent secretary. I'm just under secretary rank. I fear I shall rise no higher. Hmm, Why not? Alas, I'm an expert. (laughs) Ian Lavender appeared in 245 episodes of EastEnders. He was one of only two of the original Dad's Army cast members, along with Frank Williams, to appear in the 2016 feature film, by the way, for which Oliver produced the DVD extra featurettes, The Women of Warmington and Legacy. Ian Lavender's obituary in The Guardian helps us to learn a little more about his work on stage. In addition to various live Dad's Army productions, his stage work included the Peter Hall Company's The Merchant of Venice with Dustin Hoffman as Shylock in 1989, touring as the narrator in The Rocky Horror Show in 2005, Monsignor Howard in the London Palladium production of Sister Act, uh, which Oliver alluded to earlier, The Shawshank Redemption at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2013, and his own one-man show of reminiscences, Don't Tell Him Pike. Now on a more personal level, keyboard virtuoso and prog rock legend Rick Wakeman has paid tribute on his own official website and also um, on BBC Suffolk. They met in a hotel bar on the Isle of Man in 1988, while Ian Lavender was performing in a play Who Killed Agatha Christie. Rick Wakeman said this, I said, could I ask you a couple of questions about Dad's Army? And he said, yes, if I can ask you a couple of questions about music. We've been friends ever since. Ian Lavender was my best friend. We lived half an hour apart and my love of comedy and Perry and Croft in particular was matched equally by his love of music and especially the piano. And uh, we've put a little bit more from Rick Wakeman, including links to his tribute on the webpage. Uh, Now also from BBC Suffolk, um, Ian Lavender's friend from the village where he lived, Woolpit, Judy Dean, said that he was an active member of the local community. He watched village cricket and supported local drama clubs. She said, The thing that struck me most about him was that he always had time for the fans. He never pushed himself forward, but he always made sure people had some of his time if they asked for autographs. We've um, also just on the webpage linked to uh, some coverage of Ian Lavender's funeral service, courtesy of the East Anglian Daily Times. The weekend following Ian's passing, I felt the urge to watch some Dad's Army. And it occurred to me that I didn't yet have the Dad's Army feature film from 1971 on Blu-ray. So I treated myself. There was something really, really moving about watching this film now knowing that the entire cast are all up there together, reunited and hopefully having a really good laugh. And what a legacy they've left behind. 
But I think for most of us who are listening to this, any time we've watched Dad's Army, Ian Lavender was almost the comfort blanket, the fact that he was still here and still working. So it was a moving experience to see that very handsome young man playing Private Pike and knowing he was no longer with us. Rest in peace, Ian Lavender. I was really delighted and grateful to have met you. I think Oliver really hit the nail on the head when he mentioned the comfort blanket aspect of Ian Lavender. And I think that extends to Dad's Army. I think it is, a, whether you're sort of listening to the radio version or the cast recording of the stage show or uh, settling in to watch some of the classic TV episodes, it is uh, really one of the great uh, comfort watches or listens um, of all time. And I, I think, you know, we do, we do really hold the characters and the actors very close to our hearts. And I guess it's an indication of just how much Private Pike meant not only to Ian Lavender, but to his millions of fans. Pikey's forage cap and scarf were on Ian Lavender's coffin for his final journey. Oliver mentioned the Dad's Army podcast earlier. That's a wonderful collection of episodes that include episode commentaries, interviews, and uh, also some coverage of Dad's Army events. This was in a time when many of the supporting cast and uh, one or two of the principals were actually still with us. There really is some fantastic stuff on there. Uh, Frank Williams features um, a great interview with Bill Pertwee. Really interesting interview with Nicholas Ridley, actually the son of Arnold Ridley. Um, He wrote a biography of his father called Godfrey's Ghost and the podcast is in attendance at some really great Dad's Army events as well. Oliver was a contributor to that and um, you can hear some great commentaries with Oliver's friend Frank Williams talking about the film, talking about episodes like um, The Recruit and The Royal Train. It's no longer updated but it is still available and we have linked to that from this episode's webpage as well. So a huge thanks to Oliver once again for joining us for a special tribute episode. If you've enjoyed this one, you might also enjoy our tribute to Frank Williams, which is on our website and on all the usual podcast places. And that includes some really wonderful audio of Frank Williams himself reminiscing from Oliver's personal archive. And we take some external guidance on the fair use of copyrighted material for commentary and critique. There's some information on that at our website. You can hear more of Oliver Crocker at The Bill Podcast and see the works that he is publishing at devonfirebooks.com. Thanks to Steve Collins and to Gainesville. And thank you so much for listening.